Um, okay, I see a very different crowd from usual. Thanks for coming. Uh, so uh, today is a special day uh, because we are uh, outside salon, which is me and uh, my colleague who is now in the UK uh, because he's on sabbatical, uh, are uh, hosting the outside salon, and uh, we are in we are partnering with uh, uh, the uh, Mycological Society of Toronto to present. Uh, the screening to, uh, in a couple of days at the Art Talks Festival, and uh, we are doing this uh, panel presentation today. So I'm very excited. But first, I would like to do the acknowledgement. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates. As you probably know, it has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years, and the land uh, was and is the territory of the Huron Wendat and Petun First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississauga of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon, One Poon Bad Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peacefully share and care for the resource around the Great Lakes. And I know that you guys are taking a great care of the resources here as you are foraging for uh, mushrooms. I know that many of you are doing it. So thank you. Um, so uh, fantastic fungi futures. So uh, in this discussion, and uh, I really uh, encourage you to go and look at the exhibition afterward, uh, which is gonna be up for a little bit. Uh, so we're going to have a, a, a discussion on uh, everything fungi. Well, not everything, because we, we can't possibly do everything. Um, but we have uh, several experts and uh, uh, passionate uh, people about fungi and scholars. And uh, uh, so I would like to introduce you to um, six guests. So each guest will have up to 10 minutes to talk about their work and about uh, their interpretation of uh, fungi and mushrooms. And I know that there's difference. <laughs> I'm really, really bad with, like, um, with, like I, I am not an expert. So, and, uh, um, so the first one will be James Scott, who is, the, um, is an occupational and environmental health uh, professor, and he's coming from the Dalai Lama, uh, Dalai Lama School of Public Health at U of T. Uh, next will be Tosca Teran, who is an interdisciplinary artist who's been uh, working for a long time with mushrooms and mycelium. Uh, Shini Graham, who is a, a student uh, from uh, the Ecology and Evolutionary Biolo Biology uh, Department, yeah, at U of T. And uh, you're also involved with the ROM, right? Uh, Marshall Tyler uh, was the director of research uh, at Field Trip um, here in Toronto. Noreen Aman, who is a PhD student, and uh, she is coming from Punjab University, and she's visiting here. Um, and she's also and she's coming from fung and she's interested in uh, fungal biology and. Uh, she's working at the system, Systematics Lab in Punjab University. And uh, finally, Rotem Petranker, a PhD student and a social, uh, in social psychology from New York University. Psychology, so. Clinical psychology. They gave me the wrong, the wrong one. Clinical psychology. Now I understand a lot. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, this is the order. So without further ado, um, James Scott. Awesome. I will be very good at this keeping the time. Okay, I'll try. Uh, this is I'm going to try. You're work. very, you're very encouraged to use this. Okay, well, I can use this. Do this you is fine. Use that? No, okay. thank you very so, much to Roberta for putting this together. Perfect. It's wonderful to see all of these people the come out on a Friday night, a cool Friday night, and uh, and want to talk about fungi. So I thought. Um, what I would do is just try to set the tone a little bit and talk about something that's really fundamental to the kinds of things that we're going to hear about a little bit later, and that is to tell you something about fungal cell biology. Um, this is when all the students, their eyes sort of <laughs> set and they, they lose interest. But fungal cell biology is really, really at the heart of, of mycology, and it's the thing that sets fungi apart. So um, to start off this, this little discussion on fungal cell biology, I want to tell you about the fundamental unit of growth of a fungus. And the fundamental unit of growth of a fungus 
is a thing called a haifa. And I'm assuming that everyone here has heard of that term haifa. Um, it's spelled like this, haifa. And if you want to make it plural, you put an E on it, hyphae. And that's the fundamental unit of growth of a fungus. And all fungi have something that's kind of like that. There are variations on a theme. Now, sometimes the hyphae of fungi have these little bulkheads in them, sort of like a submarine, except the difference between a, a hypha and a submarine is that the bulkheads on a submarine are intended to keep the liquid out and the air in. With a hypha, it's the opposite way around. It's intended to keep all the liquid in, so if something busts off, all of the cytoplasm of the fungus just doesn't run out. So in this way, so these fungi grow by means of these filaments called hyphae, and if we have a whole bunch of them together, enough that we can see, and you can look in the hallway and see this, uh, so that we can see them without the aid of a microscope, we call it a mycelium. So mycelium is just a whole bunch of hyphae all kind of mashed together. So hyphae uh, are these threads that characterize fungal growth, and they're about maybe a 30th to a 50th of the width of a human hair. The difference, though, is with a human uh, who grows hair. I have a little bit that's falling off here on the top, um, but there's still some. Human hairs grow from the base. Um, in the case of fungal hyphae, they don't grow from the attached part they grow from this free tip. So the youngest part of the fungus is always at this hyphal tip. And how it grows is by secreting enzymes at the hyphal tip. And as it secretes enzymes, the stuff right around that tip breaks down. And the fungus absorbs those nutrients, and it continues to push through and grow. So in this way, this fungal filament, which is a really, it's a small thing, it acts like a chemical drill. It can drill through really, really tough stuff. You know, these fungal hyphae can drill through optical lenses. They can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, so it's, it's a very spectacular phenomenon that that hyphal tip affords to a fungus. Now, something more about fungi and fungal cell biology. I don't normally buy wine in boxes, but uh, I bought some boxes to be able to demonstrate this phenomenon, because this is a very important phenomenon to demonstrate. I don't do this in class for students, but uh, <laughs> maybe I should. So this is, a, this is uh, as, far as, I can, as far as I can tell, this is sort of the best demonstration of how fungal hyphae grow. So I want you to imagine each one of these wine boxes as a fungal cell. This is a model of fungal cell biology. So here you have a fungal hypha. It's a little squashed, so it's a little wider than it is uh, in this dimension. But the box in this case represents the cell wall of the fungus. And if you peel that back, which I tried to do with some scissors this afternoon, some of the wine ran out, so it's in a jar at home. That's OK. There's still two that are full here. And then inside that cell wall is the cell membrane. And this sets fungi apart from a number of other microorganisms that lack this outer cell wall. Now, in the case of fungi, that outer cell wall is made of the same stuff uh, that forms the shells of crustaceans and, uh, and the exoskeletons of insects. They're made of chitin, not cellulose. This is cellulose. So that's a, that's a very different thing as well. Let's see if there's some, some wine in here. This is also a fungal product here. Um, so the next... Uh, there we go. Tears. The fungi. So the next... The next thing that's interesting about fungal hyphae and that sets fungi fundamentally apart from the kinds of other organisms that people have long studied uh, is that their growth form is modular. They're not solitary organisms. They're modular organisms. What do I mean by this? So all of the, the three branches of the Abrahamic religions have had this idea of living 
organisms as being solitary entities. So in the wisdom, wisdom of King Solomon that was captured in, in Ecclesiastes, the, the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, went something like this, and this will be familiar, um, to every season, hold on, I wrote this down. <laughs> See, this is what happens when an atheist tries to quote the Bible. <laughs> to everything, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and so on and so forth. This idea that the timing of organisms operates on a cycle. Fungi exist outside of that normality. You can take this fungal hypha, and this experiment has been done with things called race tubes, which are like great long drinking straws set on their side and filled with agar, about to that much. And if you start a fungus in this end of the race tube and its hyphae grow down, by the time it gets down to the other end of the race tube, if you take another one and stick it on the end, the fungus will just keep right on growing. Other organisms don't do this. Other organisms at a certain point cease growing. So it's it's posed a number of challenges for people to kind of conceptualize how fungi fit into that greater biology of things that exist as determinate life forms because they do exhibit this colonial growth. And it's very characteristic and it's something that the, the next speaker is going to talk a little bit about. So that's just a little bit of, of background and overview on, on fungal hyphae and fungal mycelia. And I hope that uh, we'll be able to discuss that a little bit more. That's all. Are you using this one? Or? Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's that one. Just, 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 uh, just put it like close to like, here. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now we're going to go into the dark. And thanks everyone for coming out for Fantastic Fungi Futures. We'll get you some wine after. Yeah, and wine afterwards. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, you can move that down. Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know if I need the bike light. Hi, everybody. Um, so, I'm like the artist out of the group, I guess, that I've been very fortunate uh, for the past several years to be allowed into labs in U of T, um, Goodman Laboratory, just under the proviso. I don't bring any uh, spores in or any slime mold or things like that. But uh, for the past... Uh, let me see, 30 years, I've been a metalsmith, and for almost 20 years, I've been a glass artist as well. And so I'm just giving you a little rundown on that. Um, these were some pieces that I created, my own uh, pathogenic uh, kind of fungus. Uh, and these were maquettes made out of metal and glass. Um, and there was a soundscape with it. Um, so I've always had this interest in mushrooms uh, since way back. Then Fukushima happened uh, in 2011 and it really made me start questioning the materials I was working with. Uh, metals just aren't great for the planet at all and how they're mined and even if you're recycling them and glass uh, takes a lot of energy to work with. So also like growing mushrooms at home to eat, um, edible, you know, like here's some beautiful oyster mushrooms there. I started wondering about the substrate and just in all the different things I was looking at, like paper and things like that, um, it started to dawn on me that maybe I could work with the mycelium in that grows these mushrooms uh, as a material. So just a little backstory on that for me anyways is prior to migrating to Canada, um, I lived in New Mexico for about 13 years. And when I was living there, um, I built adobe walls, 
I worked on earth ships and I uh, did a lot of straw bale uh, construction. So the concept of working with straw or sand as a substrate, but rather than mud, I'd be putting mycelium in it, wasn't too much of a stretch for me. Um, so with uh, the materials I work with, uh, of course, Jeff Goldblum had to play in here somewhere, but um, I use uh, a lot of hemp, and uh, recently I've been working with uh, sugar cane, and that is inoculated with different mycelium. Somebody asked me outside, like, how are you making these forms? So I'm showing you this, like I stuff them into molds, or depending on the nutrients I work with, I can hand sculpt uh, the forms. Um, I've also worked with uh, 3D printing, like biomaterials, a biofilament that's wood or sugar-based. Um, up here on the left, I believe it is, is some wool from Iceland that I tried to see if the mycelium would grow on that. And at first it was really not growing towards it, but after I think it became very hungry, it decided to colonize that wool and try and absorb it. Um, and so something I started noticing when I was making these sculptures, like these sculptures were hanging on this wall for less than a week. This was around Nuit Blanche, but they started to grow into the wall. They started to eat the paint. So when they came off the wall, so did a lot of the paint and the drywall behind it. That was interesting. Um, and I'm not going to go into that or that'll be a lot longer and the gong will happen, but I, Something I do too is biosonify. I listen to the conductivity, if you will, of mycelium. So at Grow Up, that was something that was happening. But those jars that you see in there, um, unfortunately, I didn't have a larger image. But one had car engine oil in it, and the other two had plastic and an aniline dye. And within three days, the icky, gross car engine oil was completely consumed by the mycelium. Um, so that's something else that just I read about it, but to see it happening right before me was really blowing me away. Um, so the potentials of fungi are massive. And so here I have two things showing. This is a mycelium brick. Smashing I nearly broke my arm. And the mushroom still is doing fine. So I, I feel like my work now is um, starting to become... Uh, dun 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 for an artist anyways, more functional um, and less conceptual. I think I'm conceptualizing working with it now and uh, creating like acoustic panels um, and things like that. Um, so I took part in a three-month residency at the Museum of Contemporary Art in partnership with uh, the Ontario Science Centre earlier this year. And for the Ontario Science Center, they had a space theme. So I thought of, of course, you know, I only have a month. Um, why not build a eight and a half by 16 and a half foot wide geodesic dome and colonize it with mycelium? And I got this idea because I, uh, part of this space theme had to do with panspermia. So I was doing a lot of research and I found that NASA, uh, the Can Canada Space Agency, and the European Space Agency are looking at fungi as a possible insulating material or a material that could be sent very easily as spores to Mars or to the moon and then be grown. How they're going to do that, I really don't know. But I came up with the Mycelium Martian Dome project. And uh, there's a panel actually out in the atrium uh, that's from uh, that dome. And so, I don't know, sorry. Um, I, what I did is printed out over 140 hours, uh, these PLA nodes. The, my concept for this initially was that the entire structure would be biodegradable um, after it was completed, but everybody loved it so much, they don't want me to be throwing it out um, in the yard or things like that. Uh, so rather than cardboard, I was given wood that I think, yeah, okay, here, these wooden struts, uh, were donated by the Brothers Dressler, who have an incredible studio uh, close to Mocha. And it would turn out um, that a lot of that wood was actually teak, so it was quite a fancy dome in the end. Um, so, and also because I had such a small timeline, I didn't, I couldn't really research like my own kind of panels and how they might grow, uh, so that's what you see here. So I was fortunate 
again, I feel, to be sponsored by Ecovative Design, who are in New York. And I've worked with their materials in the past, and I know that they grow super fast, and they rarely ever contaminate. So Ecovative sent me 585 kilograms of substrate, and all you need to do is add flour and water and wait three to four days, and you've got a mycelium block that then I could fill these forms with. Um, but these are actual forms that were taken off this dome. But I did use a cookie cutter kind of uh, concept. So we could easily grow a mycelium form, remove this frame, and then the panels would lay inside of these negative spaces. That said, though, the most successful panels were the ones that I could grow right into the wood. Um, but we had to be able to break it down and then bring it to the Science Center, so I couldn't grow them all in the dome. Um, so late night, we would be filling the bags with flour and water. And I had more than three people, but this is my partner and really good friend. And it was just about as crazy as this. But just constant feeding these things to have at least five bags filled at the same time. Um, <laughs> and uh, so this is a close up of one of the panels. Um, and I also wasn't able to desiccate them properly. Uh, or So that is, like, usually when I grow or I sculpt a form, I'll put it into an oven at uh, the lowest temperature. Uh, for me at home, that's around 100, 170 Fahrenheit for about two hours. So it kills the organism, dries it out, and it also removes about 35% of the weight in water. So then they become very light. And also, at least for if somebody were purchasing something, I could usually then send it to them within Canada, let's say, or the United States. Um, and something really amazing about the mycelium, too, is how it can knit itself together. So uh, I grew some small panels here. There's a Petri dish window you could look out of. Um, and then we'd place these together, cover them up, and they would stitch themselves together. And you can see it would also take the form of whatever it was laying on. Um, and there it is in the dome. And there's the dome. So again, due to time constraints, I was only able to grow so many panels. And the other panels uh, we covered with like emergency blankets. So it gave it that kind of Apollo Moonlander kind of feel. So it really went with the Science Center's overall theme of space. Um, and I believe the next uh, slide might be a little video of the whole process. I'd like to share with you, if I may. Um, so this was my initial prototype of little pieces of like, nodes that I 3D printed so I could carry that around and try and convince people to work with me. <laughs> and that this is you know, what was going to happen. So here I'm with the Brothers Dressler and some of their employees, um, just so they could see the kind of dome I was thinking about.
yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now is researching more of the panels and looking at them acoustically. That's something I kind of came upon when installing that dome and hooking up synthesizers that were within the dome um, that the mycelium panels seem to be absorbing sound. And so now that's something I'm really starting to focus on more is that quality of it and how it's absorbing sound and growing panels and having that looked at. So that's it. Thank you. Sorry, backwards. Go, and do you, lights on or lights on? Um, I think lights on is fine. I think okay. it's kind of showing up pretty well. Yeah. So, hi, my name is Sydney. I'm a student at U of T in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And I've been working on a research project in the mycology lab at the Royal Ontario Museum. So that's what I'm here to talk about. Um, a little more? Yeah. Very close. Like a tie. <laughs> is this better? I'll also try to like project a little bit more. Um, yeah, and so I'm going to be talking about the research that I've been doing at the ROM Mycology Lab. I just kind of want to prime it, though, after seeing that art and saying that my intro to mycology and also to biology in general was actually through art. Um, it was initially sort of like a fascination with the complexity of forms and like forest floor microcosms and things that really got me to buy a lot of like field guides and mushrooms and things. and get me into biology, so I'm happy to be here at such a cool interdiscipl interdisciplinary event. Um, and so we know that nothing in nature exists in isolation and that all living forms on Earth that we see have been shaped throughout millions of years by their interactions with other living creatures. And I think some of the most interesting examples of this are interactions between insects and fungi. Um, Insects and fungi are two of the most diverse groups of organisms on Earth, and they've been interacting on terrestrial environments for like 400 million years. And throughout this time, they've had a really long time to evolve some really complex interactions with each other, some of which people might know. So one really cool one are like a whole group of interactions between insects and fungi that people might know from popular science are these parasitic fungi that create sort of zombified insects. They infect the fungi and they exert a form of behavioral control on them that totally prioritizes the dispersal of the fungus at the absolute expense of the poor insects that are infected with them. Um, they're called like zombie fungi or these flying salt shakers of death in cicadas. A sort of opposite of this type of interaction would be beneficial symbiotic um, interaction between insects and fungi. One really cool one is Termitomyces titanicus. It's the largest edible fungus on Earth. Unfortunately, it doesn't grow in North America, but it exists It exists in a mutually beneficial with termites, mutually beneficial relationship with termites. Um, there are also a lot of ants, around 200 species in the Amazon, that farm fungi, and these fungi don't live without the ants. However, there are a lot of relationships between insects and fungi that aren't so clear-cut in what's going on and who's benefiting. And the relationship that I'm studying are these, which might be familiar to people who forage for mushrooms, these are maggots. So you might know this experience of like going to your mushroom spot and collecting some mushrooms, bringing them home in your wicker basket, and then you slice them open and you see they're like full of holes inside. And there's these like little wormy wiggly guys all over the place. And these are actually juvenile insects and they're living in a really cool relationship with this fungus. Um, and you could just like, you know, enjoy the extra protein, but maybe you're wondering, what are these guys? Like, how do they get there? What are they doing? Um, and what species are they? 
And so this is what I'm working on at the ROM. Um, a general like review of the questions I'm trying to answer. I don't have time to go over all of them, but um, the main thing I'm trying to do is just figure out what these insects are, because unfortunately this type of data is kind of lacking in North America, especially in Canada. So there's, it's actually possible that a lot of these maggots that you're finding in your porcini or your lobster mushrooms are species that are new to science and not described yet. Um, yeah, and I'm also asking, do these insects that live inside of mushrooms have a favorite mushroom? Do they have a preference for what mushroom they live inside of? And like what characteristics of the fungi can determine that? And I'm also researching this with a DNA-based method that hasn't been applied broadly to this group of organisms. So I'll be commenting just like on how well that works and what needs to be done to improve identification with this method. And so, but back to like the, the maggots inside of your porcini, like how do they get there? And so not to generalize insects because you can't really generalize an insect's life cycle, but in general what will happen is an adult insect will find a mushroom, a suitable mushroom. It will lay some small white oval shaped eggs inside of the mushroom, either on the gill or in a pore most often. These small white oval eggs will develop into small white wiggling oval larvae that we call maggots. And these maggots are just essentially eating machines. So they will either eat the fungal tissue or they'll eat like microorganisms that live inside of the mushroom. And then once they're all big and healthy, they typically leave their home and they go underground or into some bark where they undergo a metamorphosis and then emerge as an adult later. And a lot of different insects live some variation of this life cycle. Most of them are flies and beetles. And I would guess based on my own data and based on data from other locations that it's in maybe like multiple hundreds of different species live this life cycle. Um, and interestingly, a recent review of the diversity of flies in Canada actually suggested that a large portion of the undescribed species of flies in Canada that remain are within two families that are often living this life cycle. And so there's a lot of biodiversity work that remains to be done. Um, and the reason it hasn't been done isn't for lack of interest or lack of trying. It's just because it's a really difficult thing to study. Um, these insects are difficult to observe and they're even harder to identify. And the reason they're so difficult to identify is because most of the time when we see them, they're existing in these white oval shapes, um, which don't really have any morphological characters that allow us to identify them. So you can have like hundreds and hundreds of different species of insect that look functionally exactly the same um, until they're in their adult forms. So in general, in order to study these insects, you have to get them in their adult form. And this is what studies in the past have done. They've collected the mushrooms, they keep them in like an enclosed container, and they wait for the insect to continue its life cycle. And then once it emerges in its adult form, once you have a jar full of like adult flies, they will put these under the microscope and identify them. But the problem with this is that a lot of these insects are living such specialized lives that they are not able to complete their life cycle once they're removed from the natural environment. So, yeah, here's a really great illustration. One attempt was made to characterize the morphology of these insect larvae. So these are all flies that are from mushrooms in um, the UK. This attempt was made in the form of a 100-page monograph published in 1937. Um, and as you can see, it has really beautiful illustrations of a lot of diverse flies from like many, many different genera that all look exactly the same. Like they don't, even really skilled entomologists are not able to really take this on. So the really, really good thing though, is that no matter what life stage you find an insect in, it will have the same DNA. So what I'm doing in my research is I'm collecting a lot of different insects doing field work. Um, we're collecting like thousands of mushrooms and we bring them back to the lab, slowly, painstakingly dissect each one and look under the microscope and try to find evidence of insect life. So here's a tiny insect egg here. It's kind of got like a little spore shadow um, growing on the gill of a mushroom. It's just living there. And we extract these insects and we preserve them in little tubes um, here's another view. And as you can see, uh, 
it takes a good eye to spot these. So all of these images contain an insect in some form of its life cycle. See if you can spot them. I promise they're all there. <laughs> yeah, it takes a good eye to figure this out. But once you learn how to like, once you adapt to this, I, we find insects in pretty much every mushroom. So we found insects really, really interestingly in um, like toxic Gallerina and Amanita species that contain a toxin that should, in theory, be lethal to insects as well as humans. Um, I've found insects inside of the psychoactive species Plutaeus americanus. Um, we find them in like super tiny Marasmus mushrooms. We find them in like the melty Caprinus type mushrooms in like tough woody polypores, like the insects are everywhere. And they're all really not well studied, but they're like, just, they're all over the place. So, did you like the answer to this? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so we got an egg, a larva, egg, larva, lots of larvae in here, and a beetle. You didn't find the last one, I'm sorry. And so, after I've collected them, what do we do with them? So each one gets pulled out with little little tweezers and goes into a little tube. We bring those back to the lab at the ROM, and we extract DNA from each one, um, which is sometimes kind of difficult. But from the DNA, we sequence um, a gene that acts essentially as a DNA barcode. And with this barcode, similar to how you would scan a barcode on a product in a shop and match it to a database of products in the store registry, we can scan this DNA barcode written in genetic code and match it to sequences in a database. And sometimes we luck out and we get a 100% match, a species like Mycetophila fungorum, who would have thought it was living in a mushroom? But other times, you know, we're learning a lot of different things. There's a lot of um, species that I'm finding in these mushrooms that haven't been known to associate with fungi. And there's also a lot of species that I'm finding that have no 100% match in the database, meaning that further taxonomic work is needed or that maybe these species haven't been described. And so this is where I'm at. This is what I am doing. Um, and I'm hoping that this will sort of motivate further taxonomy in insect biology and also motivate further study of these insects that don't get a lot of attention. And so yeah, that's my thing. This is just an intro to my research. Anyone wants further discussion about like Ecology, symbiosis, host preferences, DNA barcoding, feel free to ask some questions about this. Uh, sure, yeah, I mean, the visuals aren't so, so important, so maybe I can just, okay, if you want to go ahead yeah, and use it more as notes for myself, that's fine. It's, it's, uh, it's saved vertically rather than horizontally, so it's like horizontal slides saved on a vertical format, like I'll try playing with it in a second, yeah, if you want to go ahead for now. Yeah, that's fine, thank you.
Um, so I work with Field Trip, and our mission at Field Trip is to heal the sick and better the well through psychedelic medicines. Um, and so my role specifically is to look into research into the actual fungi that are producing some of these medicines, one of which is psilocybin. Um, so what is psilocybin? Psilocybin is a molecule. Um, it's a tryptamine analog, and it can be produced in multiple different ways. It can be produced by fungi, or it can be produced synthetically in a lab. Um, it can also be biosynthesized by non-host organisms like E. coli or yeast. Um, but it's a really interesting molecule. It's shown a lot of efficacy, clinical efficacy, for really debilitating psychiatric diseases like depression and anxiety and um, addiction. And so generally it's administered with psychotherapy psychotherapy. So people go on these profound spiritual experiences under the influence of psilocybin. And then when they come back um, from, from their trip, they're integrating this experience back into their everyday life to actually make it therapeutically meaningful. And so they're working with a psychotherapist to, to integrate this experience. Um, and it can be really profoundly meaningful to a lot of people. So um, many of the participants who have taken this molecule in these clinical studies have rated it among the most meaningful experiences of their lives. So it's, it's very profound for a lot of people, comparable to a highly meaningful religious experience. Um, so what's the difference between psilocybin um, as an isolated molecule and the psychoactive fungi that produce this molecule? So there's a lot of differences. I know you probably can't read that font, but I'll kind of um, explain these to you. So psilocybin is a single molecule, whereas psilocybin producing fungi contain psilocybin, but they contain a host of other psychoactive molecules that likely contribute to the physical and psychological effects that someone experiences when they consume um, mushrooms or psilocybin-containing fungi. Um, and the psilocybin content can vary substantially between different species of psilocybin-containing fungi. Uh, so they're not all the same. If you take something that's from Psilocybe cubensis, it might be different than something from Paniola cyanescens. There are a bunch of different species uh, many of which produce psilocybin and a variety of other alkaloids. Um, and an important thing to note is that all the clinical studies that have done work into uh, psilocybin have looked at the synthetic molecule, so they haven't actually looked at the fungi. Um, but most of the psilocybin that's being consumed by, by the world is in the fungal form. Most people who are seeking psilocybin are not getting synthetic psilocybin. They are getting um, mushrooms, generally dried mushrooms. And so it's really important, obviously, to arrive at an understanding of these fungi so we know what people are actually consuming and how all these different molecules are creating a specific effect. Um, and so another, another reason why we're so interested in this is just that fungi are amazing. I think there's a lot that's lost when you've got the single synthetic molecule because over 180 different species produce psilocybin and they produce a host of other molecules, which um, are on this slide here. So there's a very complex biosynthetic pathway that leads to the production of psilocybin, and it includes the production of many of these other tryptamines. Um, <laughs> okay. No, 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 no worries. Did magic happen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, amazing, great. Thanks, amazing. Hopefully, it's amazing. Amazing. Yes. Awesome. Thanks so much. Great. Okay, so now you guys get the the full visual of the complexity of this psilocybin biosynthetic pathway. So it starts with tryptophan, which is a simple amino acid, but then it ultimately leads to um, psilocybin. And so psilocybin, you can see, is up here. And so many fungi produce that in very high concentrations, and that's the molecule um, that gets metabolized by the liver and ultimately produces psilocin, which creates the psychedelic experience. Um, but Clearly, there's a host of other molecules, many of which likely contribute to this experience. Um, even recently, just in the last week, a couple new molecules were discovered in the fungi. Um, oh. <laughs> Hopefully, that doesn't do anything bad. Um, so these couple of new molecules, um, these are actually monoamine oxidase inhibitors that were found to be produced by the fungi. Um, and so similar to ayahuasca, for any of you who are familiar with ayahuasca, um, generally, it's got two components. It's got a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, and it also has DMT. And so the monoamine oxidase inhibitor allows for more DMT to actually enter the central nervous system by um, inhibiting the enzymes that normally break it down. 
And so it gets to the, to the brain and um, acts on receptors in the brain. So there might be a sort of ayahuasca-like effect that also comes from these molecules that are naturally produced by fungi. So clearly there's a lot of complexity there uh, that we're really interested in understanding. So some of the open questions that this leads to is, are the effects derived from consuming psilocybin-producing fungi equivalent to the effects derived from consuming pure psilocybin? I wouldn't think so, just based on the chemical complexity. Um, in theory, it seems like there should be some differences, however, however minute, from consuming the fungi compared to the actual uh, synthetic molecule. And then the ultimate goal of um, this lab that we're creating in Jamaica is to start to correlate these, the chemical profile of these really fascinating um, mushrooms with the, the psychological and physical effects that people experience when they're consuming the mushroom. So if we can say having more of this molecule or certain ratios of molecules produces certain psychological or physical effects that are either desirable or undesirable, we can start tailoring uh, the production of these fungi to be the most beneficial for patients or just for people who feel that they could benefit in some sort of spiritual or otherwise um, from, from the fungi. And so we're in the progress of developing a lab in Jamaica in partnership with the university down there. Um, we're gonna be cultivating psychedelic fungi, every known species of psychedelic fungi and chemically analyzing them. Um, and so we're hoping to gain a lot of insights from that. And yep, that's it. So hi, everybody. I, I hope you can hear me clearly. Uh, I am Noreen Aman from Pakistan, and I am visiting PhD student here at Rome, so at my college lab. So I'm here to give you a glance of mushrooms in our part of the world. So I will be discussing briefly the geography of Pakistan, what kind of climate is there, and what kind of sampling sites are there from where we our laboratory collect mushrooms, and then we describe it morphologically. And then uh, on the basis of DNA studies, we then classify and describe those species. So I will be discussing uh, new to science mushrooms, which are described from Pakistan, and uh, um, briefly about edible mushrooms in Pakistan, and uh, uh, the status of mushroom cultivation and medicinal mushrooms there. So you can see uh, it's in, uh, uh, in South East Asia, uh, the small country of uh, 800,000 kilometers square, it's Pakistan. And uh, we have uh, five major provinces. Uh, it's Punjab, Baluchistan, Sindh, NWFP, and uh, Gilgit. So most of the um, mushrooms we find is from NWFP or KPK. 70% of the mushrooms we uh, find from that area. The reason is that it's mountainous area or it has more uh, rains there. And uh, the other part are mostly semi-arid or arid, and uh, we got to get lesser rains there. And as you know that um, mushrooms need some kind of rain uh, to grow uh, and some damp condition there. So that's why most of the mushrooms we got to get from th those areas. So that's what I was discussing, that this is the part of, the, um, of my country from where we can uh, get most of the mushrooms. 
So you can see from uh, this Koopan's uh, climatic classification that most of the region is warm desert climate. But that upper north part, you can see that there are temperate zones as well from where we can get mushrooms. So it's, uh, it's not the case that there are not um, uh, more mushrooms. It is rich in uh, microbiota. And uh, uh, the studies mostly were conducted by Dr. Sultan Ahmed. He described 2,500 species. Uh, of earlier, there was uh, not much of the description of the mushroom there, but there was a great man, the Sultan Ahmed, he described most of the species. So we have a great diversity in Pakistan. We have Arabian Sea, we have mountains, as well as we have plains and we have deserts uh, there. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the view of a few of the sampling site. This is a great man who is uh, these days involved in the uh, description of most of the mushrooms, uh, Dr. Abdul Nasser Khalid, and he's on the collection side. These are the mountains, Murray Hills. And then you can see the, um, the pastures. These are fairy meadows. Uh, at the base camp of Nanga Parbat. Uh, uh, they are on to the collection. And you can see Nanga Parbat here. It's ninth uh, highest peak of the world. Okay, And uh, the, this is another uh, collection site. And now uh, from these mountainous areas, mountains, we can get the chicken of the woods. You might be knowing the mushrooms which are present in the Toronto or in Canada, uh, but these might may be new for you. So we can get the chicken of the woods from these mountains, Ganoderma, and uh, some Cortinaria species, and these are the Jacko lanterns. <laughs> yeah. And apart from the mountains, we, we then move to the uh, plains. So uh, in these plains, we have semi-arid uh, kind of climate, and we have scrublands. We have forests which have uh, lesser like uh, trees. We have acacia species there and uh, scrublands and uh, uh, in addition to those uh, forests we also have some uh, dense forests as well and this is myself collect uh, collecting and from these semi-arid kind of uh, uh, environment we got to get podoscypha petaloides species microporella species agaricus species the, this might be agaricus ceramica so this might be new species i am working on that and uh, now you can see, uh, apart from the plains, we have desert desert area as well. And from uh, deserts, we got to get different species. So you can see uh, this very dry kind of species. These are Tulostoma species and Podaxis pistillaris. This is also used in um, as edible form. People in desert area eat these species. And we have Philorenia herculeana species. This is also edible. And uh, now I'll be discussing a few species which are new to science. Like it has been only described from the Pakistan. So various um, fungal groups are involved uh, in the description of these species. Um, more specifically, the lab of uh, Professor Dr. Abdul Nasir Khalid from where I belong. They are working extensively on the description of new species as well as uh, uh, reporting the species which are new uh, already described, yet new report from Pakistan. So uh, this is Al, uh, Albertorellis rosius. This is the new to science species which has been described uh, from Pakistan and uh, on other parts of the world, it's mostly in the temperate zone of the uh, world. Uh, and it was also discovered or it was collected from uh, temperate zone of the Pakistan. And then uh, it's a species which is called Agaricus pakistanicus. It has also been discovered from a uh, temperate zone. And then Xantho Agaricus pakistanicus. You can see by the names that these have been names of Pakistan or the area from where they were collected. Yeah. And Claveri adelphus elongatus. These are claveroid fungi. And then Coprinella species. They have very fragile cap. And, uh, these are, again, Coprinellis pakistanicus. It's a new species. And then Leuco agaricus pubbiensis. Pubbi is a forest there, so it's named after the pubbi forest. And then we have uh, Horti boletus cohistanensis. Cohistan, too, is an area, so it's named after that area. And uh, this is Amanita fusa. You can see uh, the remnants uh, on, on its care. 
and then uh, cetropheria atrophurogenia uh, you see the color the distinct color of this species and uh, cono saibi punjabensis it has been discovered or described from plain areas of pakistan that semi arid zone and then uh, rasula brunio purpurea leputa lahorensis lahore is again another city of pakistan so that was uh, some of the species almost around 50 species has been described new to science from pakistan so talking about edible uh, mushrooms we have around 56 species which we can eat and people uh, from kpk mostly they are in habit of eating those wild mushrooms and some uh, some also die due to misidentification they eat the wrong species or uh, uh, that's routine and then agaricus pyosporus and uh, pilorotus like here uh, guys you guys eat um, they uh, also have varieties there uh, but because of over collection of these species and uh, deforestation they are uh, some of the species are also threatened of extinction there so the famous uh, edible mushrooms are agaricus pyosporus you are familiar with these morkela species morkela is dried there it, there is a big export um, industry there morkela is dried and then exported to other countries from there so philorenia herculiana this is uh, the desert uh, edible species i shown you earlier people eat it podaxis this is another desert mushroom and then truffles uh, we have truffles uh, also there uh, but these are yet undescribed you know all the names of the truffles uh, there are some italian truffles um, lots of species but we uh, haven't described these species as yet, as yet and i'm working on that hopefully i will name it after some some part of the country or whatever <laughs> hopefully soon yeah so talking about the mushroom cultivation we do mushroom cultivation there and uh, but it's not as famous or as vigorous as it's here uh, even then uh, there is a um, button mushroom cultivation and uh, this is paddy straw mushroom and uh, the very famous oyster mushroom and this is another milky uh, mushroom so uh, after this we have medicinal mushrooms are 50 or more than 50 medicinal mushrooms uh, have been described from pakistan and uh, these include garicus ganoderma coprinus podexis and people are using it uh, traditionally as medicines like it's uh, ganoderma here armillaria uh, jelly uh, fungi and then uh, turkey tail uh, people are using uh, this for soothing uh, properties uh, during uh, cough or cold so that was a brief uh, overview of mushrooms from my side of the world thank you so much for Absolutely not. No. no. Uh, maybe this one. Marshall was the guy from field trip. Interesting stuff. Thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? All right. Thanks. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Rotem. Uh, I'm kind of affiliated with a bunch of things, uh, but the hat I'm wearing today is the Toronto Center for Psychedelic Science. Um, yeah, I have a lot of slides. I have a lot of kind of science that I want to share. Um, kind of broadly, the, the things I want to talk about today are microdosing and what it is uh, and why we should be interested in it. And then I, I wanted to only say a few words about uh, psychedelic science, but I may say more than a few words because I feel very strongly about it and I kind of want to share it. Uh, and then I'm going to show you a bunch of results that we have so far from surveys because there's no reliable research on microdosing. Um, and I'll talk to you about future directions. So let's jump right in. Microdosing um, is a practice of taking small sub-hallucinogenic 
doses of a psychedelic. Sorry, I should say, I'm not super into mushrooms. It just so happens that some of the, some psychedelics are related to mushrooms. Uh, so yeah, this talk won't be very much about mushrooms. And as you'll see, mushrooms are actually not super popular when it comes to microdosing. So the idea is to take a small sub-hallucinogenic amount of the psychedelics so that you get something out of it, but you're not tripping. So the substances my colleagues and I were interested in were LSD and psilocybin. Psilocybin is the stuff that comes out of mushrooms. Um, and we didn't really know what we mean when we say sub -hallucinogenic. We didn't know how to rigorously define it. So we went with about 10% of a uh, recreational dose. So that's about 10% of a tab for uh, LSD and between 0.2 and 0.3 grams of dried mushrooms that contain psilocybin. Um, and so I wanna share some anecdotes because I don't know if people have heard about microdosing, but there are a lot of anecdotes floating around. People are swearing by it. They're saying, for example, that when they microdose, they seem to be able to understand things uh, for the first time they read them much more often, or that they get relief from depression or alcoholism. It helps with their migraines. These are all really encouraging anecdotes, but they're just anecdotes. This isn't science. And what my colleagues and I were interested in doing is the actual science and figuring out in more precise ways what microdosing can and can't do. Um, and so this is when I talk to you a little bit about science and how it's important to do good science. I don't know if people have heard about the replication crisis, but there's currently an issue in psychology and life sciences where a lot of old canonical research, stuff we thought we knew, we actually don't know. It's not replicating, and we want it to replicate. I won't go in too much into why this is, but I think that the best antidote for questionable research practices is sunlight. So we want to be fully transparent. And so we want to pre-register all of the research we want to do before we do it. That means we go online and we say, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And then when it comes time to publish, we show the journal. We said we would do X, Y, and Z, and we actually did X, Y, and Z. We're not pretending. It's all, it was all planned. It was all intended. Um, we also share our data. So once we publish, all our data is available publicly. And at the end, in my last slide, uh, there, there will be a link. You can go online and check it out. You can also try and repeat my analyses. Maybe I was wrong, so you can figure that out. I think that this is particularly important when it comes to psychedelics, because there are two groups that feel very strongly that we need to show that psychedelics work. One is the true believers, people who believe that psychedelics can be you know, a panacea, good for everything. Uh, and the other group is people who stand to make money. And they, of course, want to show that it works. So if you remember nothing from this talk, please remember, don't believe science unless it is pre-registered. Scientists, fight me if you don't agree. I'm, I'm happy to have a conversation about this. Please come see me after the talk if you're interested. I can talk about this for a long time. So everything I'm going to show in terms of results, everything is pre-registered. Uh, and all the data is available online. So uh, how did we do our survey work? We uh, recruited participants from uh, social media and through Reddit, and we didn't really know how many people we would have, but we ended up recruiting a ton of people. This is for study number one. We had 1,400 people, uh, mostly white, male, heterosexual. I know it's, it's kind of like haha, -ha, but it, it does represent uh, the Reddit population pretty well. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not saying that we can necessarily infer from this to everyone on the planet, but this is a good kind of starting point. Uh, so we asked, what, what do you microdose on? Most people said LSD, and then psilocybin wasn't really close. Out of the other, uh, other lysergamides were uh, quite common, and I would say that they're more chemically related to LSD, whereas psilocetin is quite similar to psilocybin. So overall, um, yeah, LSD is more popular for microdosing. Uh, so the first thing we did was we asked people, just like in your own words, what are the three main benefits and three main drawbacks that you've experienced from microdosing? And so these are the results for benefits. Most common uh, benefit is improved mood, followed by uh, improved focus, and then creativity. Sounds great. Uh, and again, we try and do science, so 
we want to have both sides of this coin. So we were also interested in the drawbacks. By far, most common drawback, illegality. Not a drawback of the substance, drawback of public policy. Uh, so I don't feel very strongly about that. Second most common, physiological discomfort. I think that is legitimate and that needs to be studied further. People were reporting stuff like um, GI issues, trouble sleeping, feeling hot or cold. Um, all legitimate concerns, but I would argue that we can get stuff off the shelf at the pharmacy that has much worse outcomes. Uh, and then the last one, the la third most common one, uh, is other. That is kind of kind of a catch-all uh, bin for stuff that we didn't know where else to put, but it was a lot of calls for more research. A lot of people saying, I don't know how this interacts with the drugs I'm already taking, uh, or medication, or I don't know if this is even good for me, or I'm not getting what I want out of it. So these are questions we can answer with more research. Now, the more, uh, I know, I don't know if you can really see things, but uh, the more astute observers may have noticed that there's a lot of um, the same thing on both sides. So there's improved mood, but there's also impaired mood. And then there's improved energy, there's also impaired energy. Uh, improved focus, impaired focus. What's going on? This is pretty weird. Um, I don't know. I have speculations. It could be that uh, different people metabolize these substances differently, and some pe it's better for some people than for others. It could be set and setting. Some people are taking it in a situation that feels better. Uh, it could be placebo. It could be that microdosing does nothing. It's important to remember. People are swearing by it, but there's no reliable research. Uh, so after this uh, kind of qualitative, um, just kind of open, say in your own words, we asked them, specific behaviors. And people said, so where, where you see a, uh, an arrow pointing up, that's an improvement, and arrow pointing down is less of that thing. It's kind of, it's a little confusing. But so, less alcohol consumption, improved anxiety, less caffeine, less cannabis, uh, better eating behavior. I think that the most outstanding thing is like mood, that almost everyone said better mood. So, I think that this is what future research should be looking at, for starters, microdosing for mood. Um, and then in terms of quantitative things that we looked at where we actually ran statistical analyses, we discovered that microdosers were lower on negative emotionality, previously known as neuroticism, and higher on open-mindedness, previously known as openness. These are two um, personality dimensions that are considered to be pretty stable, shouldn't be changing. Uh, we discovered that microdosers were higher on these than non-microdosers. Microdosers were also higher on wisdom, lower on dysfunctional attitudes, and higher on creativity. For creativity, it was an actual task that we administered, where we asked people to think of as many creative uses for an item as they can. We had judges rate it, um, and that's actually the thing that I'm most confident about because self-report, these are things that you can just kind of pretend because you believe in it. Uh, all very, very promising. And so there's more recent data that uh, I want to just mention briefly from the Global Drug Survey. It's an annual survey. It happens every year. Uh, this year, this is the amount of participants, 123,814 participants. It's kind of a big sample. It's a lot of people. Um, so, uh, fewer people than that amount reported microdosing, something like just only 8,000, still a lot. Um, and again, LSD was uh, more popular than magic mushrooms. Um, and then we also asked again about benefits and drawbacks. We wanted to compare. So th this is again the uh, benefits that I showed you before. And these are the benefits from the Global Drug Survey. So. I would say that the, for the benefits, we found pretty similar things. Uh, the three most common benefits from our previous sample were mood, creativity, and energy. And here it was mood and energy and creativity switched spots, but overall a similar trend. Uh, in terms of drawbacks, totally different. Uh, what we have for drawbacks is where, where we had illegality here was 29.5%. In the global drug survey, it's 4.2%. People were not really worried about it. Could be due to a variety of reasons, this difference. Um, maybe our wording was different. Maybe 
People who participated in the Global Drug Survey don't really feel bad about using drugs. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, physiological discomfort was still pretty high up. Uh, but yeah, otherwise it was quite different. Last thing I want to show is why people microdose. We asked, why did you start microdosing? Surprisingly, most commonly, just curious. They didn't even know. They were just like, I wonder. That's cool. Uh, and then mood, mood, creativity, and productivity. Um, there were very few people reported things that I would expect, like treat ADHD, um, avoid boredom. Most people were just curious, which is pretty cool. So in terms of future directions, this uh, is broadly the design of a study that uh, we're going to start running in a lab at CAMH early uh, 2020. Um, and I'm pretty excited about it. It's been a ton of work to get it uh, to Health Canada and CAMH. Uh, so it's possible that microdosing could be useful to enhance mood, uh, mindfulness, it could be for alleviating depression, anxiety, uh, could boost creativity. There's so much that it could do. So stay tuned and I will let you know. These are people who were involved in this research. I want to thank all of them. And finally, this is the link that I promised. Please go on it, look at my data and run the analyses. Make sure that I'm not lying. And feel free to check out our website for this uh, Toronto S Center for Psychedelic Science. It's psychedelicscience.ca. And please email me if you have questions. No, but like uh, she's bringing another one. Okay. Otherwise, I can just drag another chair here. It doesn't really matter. So we have two microphones here. Um. I think it'll be fine. <laughs> it is a fungal product. I didn't talk about yeasts at all. Yeasts are interesting as well. And they are sort of hypo in a way. They're just hypey that have learned to break their cells apart where the cross walls happen. So, all right. So, uh, I know that people have questions. They were trying to ask questions before, so um, bring them out. So, I and Marshall. Um, what do you think would be the timeline for the the realization of the immunization of penicillin for the Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, depends on where you're looking. So in the US, for example. Oh, yeah, sorry. The question was, what do you think is going to be the timeline for legalization and, and or decriminalization of these psychedelic substances? Um, so if we look at the US as an example, there are many, many decriminalization and legalization movements happening right now. Um, psilocybin was recently decriminalized in Denver, Colorado, and then entheogenic plants in general, which includes not just psilocybin, but iboga, um, peyote cacti, and other uh, all entheogenic plants were uh, decriminalized in Oakland, California. And then there's movements to both legalize, um, legalize psilocybin in California and then legalize psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy in Oregon. Um, I think like the bigger question, so the timeline I would say is sometime within the next five years, we'll start to see some form of legalization take place. The question is what that form is going to be, because in Oregon, for example, it's a very strict framework where it's psilocybin assisted psychotherapy. And so not anyone could just go to a dispensary, pick up some mushrooms and bring them home. Anyone could use these, but they'd have to do it in licensed facilities under a therapist's guidance, which is really important because these are pretty profound experiences that probably need a lot of oversight um, to prevent any kind of harm. Um, but yeah, so to your question, I would say sometime in the next five years, but it's an open question as to what it'll look like. I don't know if you want to say sure, I, have, I, I think that's an excellent answer. I actually have nothing relevant to add, but I'll add irrelevant information instead. <laughs> um, 
there's one model that I've heard of that I uh, really like. It's by from Mark Hayden, who's the head of Maps Canada. Uh, he suggested that it would be more like people would get a license to purchase mushrooms, uh, and then they could do them whenever they wanted. You just have to go and see a doctor that, uh, or like a mental health professional who makes sure that you're sound of mind and you can take psychedelic substances because they're potentially harmful. Uh, so I think that's a good model. So, two, did you ever grow out the panels for each of them, or did you just stop with it? Um, how much did they weigh? How should each one of those panels weigh? I don't know. Um, like, one is outside. Yeah, one is, okay. um, one is here, um, out there, so and it's one, yeah, 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 no, it's okay. It's a question because some people didn't hear, so uh, oh. the, Uh, yeah, how much uh, does each panel weigh? And um, was I able to grow out the full dome, like with the mycelium growing fully? No, I wasn't. Um, and there's a couple of like yet, I, that wasn't able to happen. Um, so I'm uncertain of the weight, and I'm, it hasn't been grown fully um, because there's like one big thing that happened, and that was it went and was installed in July at the Science Center. Um, on August 14th, I flew to Australia for a residency. I won an environmental award. So while I was away, uh, some colleagues of mine dismantled it when it needed to come down. Um, but something I am looking at and trying to find a place in Toronto, uh, some idea has been uh, perhaps the land behind the Museum of Contemporary Art. There is a park that's, uh, I think, slated to happen there, but it's very contaminated uh, soil. So some people um, that work at MOCA or kind of around that area have been thinking it might be really great if it could just kind of be plopped there, erected, and then I can reinstall some of the panels, but then grow it, like just grow them right into the wood there and see happens and have uh, maybe scientists and people that were from the forestry, forestry ministry come like they did for the giant tree if anybody is familiar when that was up at MOCA and do soil samples like before and after and just check that and another reason I wasn't able to weigh them was just it was also a timeline um, but I could see someone that worked with me was wondering about that but um, I would have to say they may have weighed anywhere between three, like maybe three to five pounds max, um, just because of structurally and what we were doing, and if I could guess, um, how much we used. Something different happened between the ones that actually were able to desecrate properly and the ones that actually didn't. Um, well, the. Some of them didn't kill properly. Did any of them actually? No, they all. Um, no, actually, they all really dried out. Um, it was really dry where they were being kept in uh, the Dressler Brothers studio. Um, but the ones that were grown directly into the struts, like into the wood, they were alive when we brought them. And I say alive, like they were kept in a humid kind of chamber, like they were covered with landscaping cloth. So when we brought them to the Science Center and we actually attached them to the dome. I think it was like the second day I noticed a lot of liquid coming out and I thought I'd better remove that plastic now. So nobody at the Science Center really freaks out that it's still living, <laughs> but also so it could start drying and things like that. Do you think 
any of the insects that are laying eggs and developing larvae in mushrooms are using CO2 sensing to find the mushrooms from respired CO2? I have no idea. So <laughs> I did I did look into this and I was not able to find any sort of research that's been done on how these insects find mushrooms. I did find one study about how, really interestingly, parasitoid wasps find mushrooms to lay their eggs inside of the fly larvae that are inside the mushrooms, which is like a whole other layer of biology that's really cool. Um, and the study itself was actually kind of inconclusive. Their negative control ended up being like more attractive to the flies than the thing that they were trying to study. Um, their hypothesis was that it was color driven, um, and they concluded that it was not color driven. Um, other than that, it's really hard to determine. Although, interestingly, um, the chemical that's kind of responsible for that classic mushroom smell called 1 octene threol, um, some studies have shown that increased production of this chemical does attract insects and that some, especially like the longer lived polypores and stuff will like have cyclic production of this chemical and they'll attract more, especially beetles for some reason, they'll attract more beetles when the production of this chemical is high. Um, yeah, it, it's really, it's not super well studied, but I think that's a good place to start is this chemicals and stuff. I probably. I'm not sure. Yeah. So just to add to that, so let's see. Oh, this one works too. Look at that. So just to add to that, there's actually not a lot of metabolism that's going on in the mushroom. The mushroom is mostly just a hydrostatic thing. So they're 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 not particularly metabolic, but they're there is a lot of secondary metabolism. So that one octane three all, there's three methyl furan, there are a whole bunch of these things that, that seem to be, they have very low odor thresholds for humans, um, and they seem to probably be involved in uh, as insect attractants. So I suspect that's probably some part of the mechanism of how that works. Yeah, because you can certainly bait a trap with a mushroom and you can get it right full of insects flying in. Uh, you know, there's been some work looking at that with these mycetophilids and Sierra flies, so I suspect that's probably how it works. Um, that's a really good question. So we were able to. Why, well, yeah, sorry. Uh, why, why did we partner with Jamaica to start up this uh, research into psychedelic fungi? Um, the, the question has multiple parts. One of the primary reasons was we have a strong relationship with the University of West Indies. Um, so the lab itself is actually going to be located on their campus. Um, and we're going to be able to employ a lot of their scientists, um, which is great. And the other, the other thing, obviously, is legality. So it's much easier to operate in a landscape where these mushrooms are largely unregulated versus if we tried to set something up in Canada, for example. There's all sorts of hurdles we'd have to go through, uh, which would slow down research. So it's, yeah, those two points. Any other questions, Marshall? So I are there intentions to patent these compounds or what, what are you going to do with it exactly uh, once you identify them? Um, so it's a little bit unclear. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. What are, we, what are we gonna do with the compounds that we end up identifying in these uh, psychoactive fungi? Um, so, I mean, some of them are known, a, a lot of them are known actually, and so a big part of it is just looking at the chemical variation that exists between species, and so there's no intention on patenting that because you can't simply patent the chemical variation. Um, one of the potential value additions that the, the lab would have is that as certain states and countries start to legalize um, these psychedelic compounds, there's definitely going to be a, a regulated market for them. And part of that regulated market is going to involve testing of these compounds, analytical testing of all fungi that hits the market, um, both safety testing to make sure there's no kind of toxins. Because when you're cultivating fungi, inevitably other fungi try to colonize, and then there are bacteria and whatnot that can produce harmful mycotoxins. 
Um, so, so part of that will be safety panels, and then part of it will be looking into uh, the, the chemical composition of all the, the fungi that get to market. Um, so we're hoping we can help provide value in that way and inform these, uh, the regulations as they start to emerge. But there's no intention of patenting any specific chemical combination or anything like that. So I'm not going to say that everyone in this room is excluded, but everyone in this room is probably excluded. Um, sorry, that's right. Sorry. Yes, so the way we're going to recruit participants for our study um, is I don't want to give it away too much uh, because we kind of we want participants to be to not have too many preconceived notions as as much as possible in reality it's just going to be online and there will be flyers but if you go if you go on the website and if you subscribe for our updates you will know when when um, we're going to start recruiting I just said much but um do you know if there's like is it a link is microdose is it linked to serotonin and dopamine production at all sure oh sorry the question is 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 microdosing there i remembered <laughs> is it related to dopamine and serotonin the answer is sure uh-huh and so i guess the that like, are we, are we seeing people building tolerance and needing to increase the dosage? And then are we also seeing them have like their yeah. Right. I think that those are both excellent questions, and I will repeat them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> is there, uh, um, so question one is, do, pe do people develop tolerance? Uh, short term, yes. Long term, no evidence for that. So. We don't exactly know what the short term is. Is it's likely dose dependent, um, but from other research for on on molecules that are either psilocybin or analogous or similar, um, it's between two and seven days that the tolerance is that it, like exists, I guess. And then the second question: Does does it uh, do people develop serotonin debt? I don't know that that happens. If if you're like kind of comparing it to MDMA. Uh, I don't think that people have come downs. In fact, most bad research in the field uh, speaks about the afterglow, that people feel excellent the next day. Well, thanks. Uh, sure. Yeah, so microdosing has always been uh, pretty interesting to me. It hasn't been studied with the kind of rigor that larger doses have been studied with, which is very unfortunate. Um, one of the fears with microdosing is that these molecules are also activating the serotonin receptor 5H2B, um, which can lead to cardiovascular problems. We're not sure at those doses over extended periods of time whether that would be the case or not, but clearly those studies need to be done. Um, and beyond that, people who are predisposed to any sort of psychotic illness, like schizophrenia or uh, bipolar disorder, um, might be especially susceptible um, to, to an early psychotic break if they're participating in either microdosing or macrodosing. It's still unclear. That might not be the case, but it's something to always uh, keep in mind. So basically, especially with microdosing, more research needs to be done because not much has. The clinical studies that have looked into larger doses have shown that there's a correlation between the intensity of the experience and the clinical outcome in the cases of depression and anxiety. Um, which would suggest that for those potential use cases, uh, microdosing might not be as effective, at least for the patient population that was looked at in those studies. But it's possible that effects on creativity and these other factors um, might be enhanced with microdosing. There's just a lot of open questions there. Um, speaking of psychedelics, I'm just curious about if there's any research in Pakistan uh, where I'm, like if of all the mushrooms and everything that are being discovered or looked at, if that's something that's happening there or on the radar? So with respect to research, there is none, none started yet, although people are using these as drugs for pleasure. <laughs> yeah, there is market there, hidden market. So they are using those, but uh, about research, maybe sometime soon, somebody Maybe I may start sometime after the interest getting here. 
So that's it. It's my favorite question. Um, I think in the case of most of the insects that I'm collecting, which are those that really only interact with the fungus when they're in this larval stage and all they do is eat it, I think probably not. I think it's probably, to me, it seems like it's more of a neutral effect. Um, it's really interesting because you think that because they're eating it, it would be a detriment. But from what I've observed from like dissecting thousands of these mushrooms is that the larvae inside don't tend to damage the reproductive tissues of the mushroom, which is pretty cool. They tend to just kind of chew through the context and the stipe, and then they get on with their day into the soil. Um, but some, some interesting research is also currently being done just in the last like five years about um, adult beetles and whether or not they're able to carry spores. Um, and this is pretty cool. There's some recent papers that show like really awesome scanning electron images of like the backs of beetles with spores really stuck inside of these tiny grooves in their plates. Um, whether or not this is like important for the fungus or whether it's just incidental is kind of hard to tell. Um, yeah, people think it might be important for, for example, mycorrhizal species, which would be at an advantage um, if their spores are able to be brought closer to rootlets of plants to be able to attach. And some beetles that bore into the ground might be able to facilitate that transfer. But yeah, I think most of the insects that I'm finding are really just kind of living inside the mushroom, not helping it or hurting it. They're just kind of there. Maybe they're tickling the hive. <laughs> 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 Massaging it a little bit, yeah, perhaps. Uh, increase the genesis in mines and also to use uh, a extinguish condition here. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any uh, studies on human with no doses of penicillin to treat PTSD. Are you looking into a examination or a sensitivity to penicillin for the PTSD? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. So. The question was, there's evidence from research on rats that the administration of small amounts of psilocybin uh, enhances uh, fear extinction. So basically, like rats learn to be afraid of something, and then they're, taken, they're given a small amount of psilocybin, and then they're not so afraid of that tone or whatever. Um, and it, we don't have plans to do that with humans in this upcoming study. There, it's already really clunky because you see how many uh, positive and negative things people reported, so we want to test all of those things. Uh, so we're going to focus on that for now. I think that I agree with you that it would be really interesting to study it, especially in the context of, say, dealing with trauma. And I think that that would go pretty well, that dovetails with what we already know about large doses and dealing with trauma. Um, for sure, interesting stuff. This is not what we're going to do for this first study. Sorry, one thing that I'll quickly add to that is that um, with, with microdosing, there's not psychotherapy that comes with it. They can be, but you know the way that it's generally done is people just taking these doses as part of a daily routine and not with um, psychotherapy as an additional component. The clinical efficacy that's been shown with larger doses has been in combination with psychotherapy, which is a really important thing to consider. It might be very different if you're taking these drugs at like a party versus if you're taking it in a very controlled clinical setting. So this is kind of tricky. <clears throat> um, we're not looking for clinically depressed people. We're looking for people with de depressive symptoms. The reason is because if you get, if you include people that are clinically depressed in a clinical trial, then you need to show that you're giving them, you're comparing it with treatment as usual. That's one reason. And so we'd have to be comparing microdosing versus um, SSRIs. And we're not ready for that yet because we don't even know that it does anything, let alone compete with whatever the frontline uh, treatment is. And another reason is that people who are depressed, the more depressed you are, the less likely you are to keep going with a study that takes weeks. We don't want attrition. We want to retain as many participants as possible. Can we go back to the very beginning, and um, James, uh, I wasn't quite clear about how you described uh, that 
fungi or mycelium don't have um, kind of like normal life cycle that other plants do. So is that being that they never die? <laughs> so the question is, fungi never die? <laughs> really? So they do. Their cells die just as our cells die, but their whole organism doesn't die. It keeps going. Yes, it's the it's it's modular growth. It's this it's this wonderful innovation of modular growth. This thing that it may have individual cells that die, but there's always a meristem. There's always a growth point from which it can continue. So that's that results in colonies that can be hundreds, maybe even thousands of years old, that are the same genetic individual. So these very, very old uh, fungi that just keep plowing through, keep marshalling their way through the soil, uh, finding new trees to form symbioses with and things like that. So it's, it's really a, a great innovation that fungi have been able to do. Now, not all fungi can do that. There are some that have a, a form of programmed cell death, but many of them are able to do it, and it's uh, it's really a great innovation. Uh, sure, they they form large networks. They can form very stable networks. You know, this idea of uh, the the kind of Paul Stamets idea of mycelium being this kind of pre primordial internet. <laughs> it's not all that far from from incorrect. You know, there were studies done in the 1970s where folks would feed a little bit of radio-labeled uh, substrate to, to a fungal network over here, and in a very, very short period of time could detect it over there. Um, over a very long uh, uh, spatial uh, area, and it's, it's sort of difficult to conceive of a fungus being able to do that, yet these things really, they can shuttle chemicals around, and they, they can support the communication of other things that they interact with. And we're, we're just at the beginning of, of understanding how that works. So the, the question is, have, have we ever read on psilocybin or uh, other fungi as potential aphrodisiacs? I have not seen any evidence-based literature on that, but I have heard a lot of anecdotal reports. <laughs> Yeah, well, it doesn't grow to be a definite size. So the quest, the question is, you know, you keep using this term modular. Uh, what does it mean? Well, it it means that the fungus doesn't grow to be a particular thing of a particular size. You know, I can buy a poodle, and if it's a regular poodle, it grows to this big, and it doesn't get it. You keep feeding it, it doesn't get any bigger, <laughs> you know, uh, or whatever. So the 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 kind of spatial. Uh, dimensions of the organism are controlled somehow at the cellular and genetic level. Um, but it's not, well, it, 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 in the case of determinate organisms like that poodle, it is pre predefined. So most of the things that are the macroscopic organisms that we've been familiar with since 3,000 years ago when, when King Solomon was thinking about these things, they grow to a particular size and they don't keep growing. Plants, there are some plants that can grow to a fixed size, and then there are others that, are, that can continue to grow. So the classic example of, of something that could be determinate or indeterminate is the tomato. There are tomato cultivars that will grow to a particular size, they don't continue growing. There are other cultivars that will grow, keep growing, as, as much stuff as you're willing to feed them, they'll keep growing. For the most part, fungi are all indeterminate. They're all modular like that. We do see things like, like mushroom fruiting bodies that are determinate, but they're attached to the 
nutritive organ of that fungus that exists under the soil that's completely indeterminate. Can you try to do that? So this, I, uh, I think, does it ever connect? Yeah, yeah. They connect with each other. They connect with the hyphae of other things. They connect with roots of plants. They connect with, with uh, bacteria, filamentous bacteria, non-filamentous bacteria. They can anastomose. They can form bridges across all kinds of things. They don't even have to be related. They can even exchange genes back and forth. They're really good at doing things that, that the rest of life that we're familiar with just can't do. There are all kinds of barriers to it, but these things just do it like anything. How do the fruiting bodies do it? Most of those mushrooms that are that are on the forest floor that are getting riddled with those little flies, they're not reproductive. Their basidiospores are not going on to, to produce other colonies. Yeah. What they do is contribute new genetic material to a fungus that's already there. So they help an established fungus in the soil be able to adapt to local environmental change. They're not going on to, to re-establishing colonies. Some of them may, but I think that's not pr principally the, the function of those basidiospores. Or maybe they're just there to feed the flies. <laughs> I, I did realize that... Um, that my new drag name, if I ever take up drag, is going to be Mycetophila fungorum. I want to be that, that fly that's got a wonderful name. I think James has just revealed something here to all of us tonight. It will be my, my alter ego, Mycetophila. Oh my goodness, my girl, like one and then two and three and four. See? Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't completely know the answer to that question, but I, I, so the question is how many symbiotic species of fungi are there? particularly the ones that are mushrooms. Um, at northern latitudes, uh, I'd say the vast majority of those macrofungi are symbiotic. If you go into the tropics and look at forest mushrooms, the vast majority of those are not symbiotic. They're mostly uh, uh, saprotrophic. Um, but if you set aside mushrooms altogether and think about fungi just generally, there are tons and tons and tons of symbiotic fungi that are symbiotic with insects, that live in the guts of insects, that live on the exoskeletons of insects. There are probably more symbiotic fungi than non-symbiotic fungi across the board, is my guess. But, you know, so if we know 750,000 species, maybe a million species of fungi, I'd say probably there's a, a chance that about 60% of them at least are going to have some, some kind of symbiosis with one or more, more other organisms. It's, which, which is, it, it goes to show you that it's important to cooperate in order to get stuff done. <laughs> you know, this whole idea of individualism, it's just, it's a really new idea. Um, but no, it's, it's, cooperation is the thing that's really important. Great question. The question is, is there any way to compare the benefits of microdosing and macrodosing, so taking large amounts? The answer is that if people were more concerned about replicating each other's work, then they would use the same scales. So there's, say, there's like 20 scales for depression, and then 
people do research using a bunch of these scales instead of, say, focusing on a couple, and then they can compare between studies. So what we did is we used a couple of the most popular ones that have also been really popular for uh, psychedelics research. So, so in general, we've tried to use on one end, because we know that we're studying something that's kind of unconventional, we're trying to use well-validated scales and tasks. But at the same time, we're trying to use stuff that's been used by other people in psychedelics research so that we can compare along the same metric. So you won't be comparing the we, will, we won't be administering large doses, but we can compare because if, if it's a lab study and we, so there have been a couple of um, studies where they used macro doses with less therapy or with no therapy at all. And so we can compare with that. This is a question for the Lord Marshall and James. So I'm thinking about James again. James. Well, that's what my mother calls me. So. Not quite James. Not quite James. Um, so as you were just talking about how the plant is growing modular and we adapt genetically to their environments and extract and exchange genetic So I don't need to recap, but with that in mind, how does that complicate standardizing even one of the species you use? Can you actually create a can you actually construct a genetically sealed environment where you control all of the microorganisms and the minerals of the soil that you're using? Because there, there are so many components that would be involved. I mean, I, I, somebody has tried several different kinds of things, you know, both recreationally and So. I, I have never experienced anything that was not the same. It's never been the same for obvious reasons. So I don't know how you take organic material and you have a hard time doing it with cannabis and you have a hard time doing it. So unless you're just taking psilocybin and it's clearly not going to be So I just, like, I don't know how, what you're telling us about what it needs to grow and what it provides. And that's a complicated issue about what you're trying to do. Yeah, so that's a great question. So the question was, there's clearly a lot of complexity, and so how do you take all that complexity and sort of make it into a standardized product um, where, you know, you can have reliable, predictable amounts of these various tryptamines that have the psychoactive effect? Um, that's a great question, and it's something that we've talked a lot about um, internally, and I think there's a few ways to go about doing it. Um, one is obviously genetic selection to the to the extent that you can to produce a sort of monoculture. But even within that, even research groups that have looked at homogenous genetic material and cultivated a batch of mushrooms have shown that between individual mushrooms picked from the same substrate, the the concentration of psilocybin can vary up to threefold. So how do you control that? It's pretty difficult. We have some ideas. Um, for example. Looking at the, we, we tend to think of the mushroom and the psilocybin in the mushroom, but there's also mycelia. I mean, the, the vast majority of the biomass here is mycelia and not the actual, the fruiting body of the mushroom. Um, and so it's possible that it's easier to standardize the mycelia than it is to standardize the mushroom product. And then there's also the chemical analysis downstream, which will allow for that sort of standardization, right? So even if this time we got five grams of psilocybin instead of four grams for the overall crop. You can taper that down then, right? As long as you can do the chemical analysis and understand what's in there, you can tailor those ratios. Um, so I think it starts with having robust chemical analysis and understanding the biology and chemistry. Um, controlling dosage by chemical analysis, not by weight of grams or anything like that. Whatever. Yeah, so it would be a combination. Like ultimately what really matters is like the numbers at the end, right? Like how much psilocybin is there and how much of these other tryptamines that might contribute is there. Um, it's the, the biomass, shouldn't, if it's 10 grams or 5 grams of mushroom, that shouldn't matter, right? It's how much psilocybin or these other molecules that are contributing to the effect. So you can standardize that um, by, you know, combining things or hopefully by a robust production methodology that, that relies on homogenization and whatnot. 
Um, but yeah, it's a great question because it will definitely be a challenge to do. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I have really anything to add to that. It's you know biology. It's really difficult uh, stuff, and you know m many of these organisms they have evolved to be able to adjust themselves to be able to cope. Uh, so you know in in the laboratory, if you take an organism, say one of these mushrooms or a microfungus, and you put it on an agar plate, and the cells start dividing, and you end up with a colony which is just a, a circle of hyphal tips that grows out centrifugally, if there's one mutation in one terminal cell, that leads to a sector. So it, that becomes essentially the parent of a whole series of, of cells that are then different morphologically, in some cases biochemically, genetically from the parent. And that, that kind of variation can happen in such a short span of, of time, in, a such, in such a small space, that it's actually very, very difficult on an industrial scale to be able to, to sort of cope with it. So uh, the, the answer to your question is that some things are much more prone to that than others. And the things that are really prone to that, you know, I don't know that until we can find a way to tame that genetic tendency that, that there's, it's gonna be really easy to put them to use. Um, certain of these saprotrophic mushrooms are actually less, they're less susceptible to those kinds of issues, which is, which makes them uh, better to work with. But it's a very good question that you asked, and it's a question that um, people who've worked on, on biopesticides are very concerned with, because, you know, if you're marketing a biopesticide to get rid of flies or to get rid of whatever, you want it from batch to batch to maintain the same activity. So these are questions that, that are much larger questions than uh, than the psychedelics, but uh, it's the same phenomenon. We only, we only have time for one major question, and so they are very fast. So who wants to go? Uh, you seem to be very late. Like... Okay. The last one. Last one. Anybody else? Oh my God. <laughs> Sure. No, uh, there's a, uh, well, we want to last cast. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I need to. I know, so there's a gentleman. They're so nice and they let us stay. Oh, my God. So, I got to ask you something. Were the mushrooms absorbing sound from the synthesizers or were the mushrooms playing the synthesizers? Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> I need to. But. And um, for those of you that are going to be going to the screening of Fantastic Fungi on Sunday, and for those of you that didn't get tickets, there's more screenings coming in January, but um, there will be um, some midnight mushroom music playing as people go into the theater. Um, so yeah, um, I, that's a really long answer, <laughs> but so I'll let somebody else, but we can talk out there. Yes. Okay. One of the um, one of the insect pathogens that I showed in the beginning, the um, flying salt shaker of death, the massospora fungus, actually does produce a small amount of psilocybin, which is really interesting. Um, there hasn't really been yet. I think there's research ongoing at like UVA um, about like why this is and how it acts, but people have been proposing as one thing um, as like psilocybin being something that interacts with insects somehow, not necessarily as like a deterrent, but as some way of, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been associated with insects, especially because it's most commonly found in either like late stage wood, wood growing mushrooms or mushrooms that grow on dung. So those are a lot of insects around there. And those zombie are very good to the relationship between small 
Yeah, yeah, they're they're not the zidiomyces. Yes, yeah. I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, there's been some evidence that these molecules might have an appetite suppressant effect in at least some insects. Um, so it's possible that it's anti-predation. Um, it's interesting because it, like the recent paper that showed that there's those monoamine oxidase inhibitors that are produced by um, psilocybin-containing fungi shows that they're much, much higher in the mycelia and specifically in the hyphal tips. Um, it's unclear why that's the case, but it seems like yeah, I mean, the same biosynthetic pathway that produces those also produces psilocybin, and it seems like when fruiting body initiation happens, that's when psilocybin concentration starts to go up. So clearly, if there's some sort of defense mechanism in, uh, in the mycelia themselves, then the mushroom has like a slightly different, subtly different mechanism, so they might be fending off different predators or whatnot. But yeah, it's very much an open question, really fascinating. I can maybe add to that a little bit, and this is sort of hypothesis. A lot of a lot of these these secondary compounds are really nitrogen rich, uh, which you think of it's sort of an odd thing because the fungi that produce them grow in really nitrogen poor environments for the most part, except for the ones that grow on dung. They're a bit of an exception, but a lot of the others, um, the the pigments that fungi manufacture and the secondary compounds that are involved in, in uh, psychoactive effects are very, very nitrogen-rich compounds. So it's one possibility is that, that these, these may have some functionality simply as storage compounds. They're ways to shunt excess nitrogen uh, into, a me in, into a form that's not necessarily directly usable by other things. Um, so it may be partly uh, because of the, the toxic uh, effects, but it's just a way to to kind of protect their little piece of the pie. I don't know if I completely believe that if it, if it explains it, but it's an interesting observation that they're nitrogen-rich compounds that are manufactured in a very nitrogen-poor environment. Not a storage mechanism. Doing their investing nitrogen in it for a good reason. There has to be some kind of feedback, yeah. But storage storage is is a reasonable hypothesis mm -hmm. on the one hand. I don't know. I want to thank ArtSci Salon oh, and the Mycological 